If you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms 29, and we're going to uh, begin reading in the very first verse. Psalms 29, in the first verse. Uh, while you're turning there, again, always remember me as your pastor that I would be finding what the Lord would have me to do. Psalms 29, in the very first verse. Psalm of David, the Bible says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The word of the Lord, of the Lord excuse me, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord beareth the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon, and Syrian, like a, like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the winds to calve, and discovereth the force. In his temple doeth every one speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together once again to this place. Lord, we pray for those that were not able to be here today, Lord, that you would bless them uh, that where they may be. But Lord, we know by your own power and your own knowledge that everyone that was supposed to be here is here, Lord, and we give you praise for that. Lord, we pray that you would fill this place like you did in the days of Isaiah, when he was there by himself, and your train filled the temple, Lord God, we pray for that this morning. Lord, we understand and know that salvation is only from you. And Lord, if uh, you don't convict the lost, no redemption will happen. Lord God, we pray that you, uh, we as the saved people, uh, that we might be drawn closer to you this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and all of you understand and know who David was. And I always thought it was curious that the Bible said concerning David that God said he was a man after my own heart. And, and you know, when you look at that, you have to understand, and the only thing I can come to the conclusion is this. Number one, the redeemed part of David, yes, was an individual after God's own heart. And the other portion, you know, David had some characteristics like no one else illustrated through the Bible. Number one is zealousness. Man, he was zealous for the things of God. When a 14, 18 year old boy goes out on the field and says, I'll take him by the mighty God in heaven. I'll bring him down. You know, you don't find that in modern day. You don't find young men saying, hey, if it's across the waters, I'll go, whatever happens. If I'm to preach the gospel, I'll do it. You don't find that. And when they do go preach, they give you some kind of little semi-song sermon, really they don't even line up with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. and, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, we need to really look at the example of David, if nothing more than what the Bible says concerning him. Uh, and so in the psalm, David begins this way, give unto the Lord. Now, with that said, I ask you, what have you given unto the Lord today? Uh, we're uh, 11 hours into this day, 11 hours into this week. What have you given unto the Lord? See, what, what life had taught David is that the Lord comes first. And that's a very, very hard lesson to learn. And unfortunately, a lot of people think they know it. But most people don't know it till they're about my age or past. Give unto the Lord. We as the Lord's people, uh, what, whatever he asks of us, whatever he desires, we need to give it to him. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord's glory 
and strength. Now, we've talked a lot over the years about glory and exactly what that means. The Pentecostals have about removed it from Baptist churches. But giving glory is simply shedding light upon it. Uh, illuminating what God really is. And see, uh, to, illuminate, to illuminate what God is, you've got you to set aside what God's not. You know what? God's not wringing His hands this morning hoping you might do something. Uh, that's just not the God of the Bible, is it? Right. So to illuminate His sovereignty, you have to say what He's not. You know what? Uh, God's not involved in these big uh, uh, so-called churches. You know, I heard just the other day, and I won't say it, but it's in this little town, a group that, that called themselves a church, and they were speaking of a woman that went there years ago, and, and they said, Mama would die if she could see it now. And she was talking about the modernism that had crept in. And you know what? I knew the woman well. Helped take care of her when she was dying. Probably they're right on money. She probably would die if she could see what it, uh, what it is. But you know what? God is not in a, some kind of light music show. How foolish. How, how crazy. And, and so as David is writing here, he says our glory belongs to God. We need to illuminate Him. He needs to be the focus. Verse 3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The, the word of uh, the, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Now, I want you to see that the next thing that David attributes to God is the water. Now, uh, what everybody wants today is smooth sailing. No problems whatsoever. And, and, and you know what? Uh, people that don't understand Satan and don't understand the devil, uh, when trouble comes up, well, the devil's done that to me. No, most certainly not. Now, the, the only way that he's done it is he could be a dispute like he had with Job. And you know what? With that, he said, you can go this far. No further. And, and, and so we find then that as David is talking about all these storms and waters and, and habit that can wreak to be wreaked upon us, what he says is this. He says God is in that. God is the author of it. God made it that way. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, when trouble comes our way, we need to learn to begin to get our lessons from it and give God the praise for it. Sing unto the Lord, all ye saints of his. Now, uh, I think it's very interesting how David put that in the next line. He, he, he wrote of the terrifying storms. And in the very next verse, he says, let's sing about them. Let's sing glory unto God. When the news is bad, let's give God the glory. When the news is marvelous, let's give God the uh, glory. When there's nothing left to do, let's give God the glory. And that's what he was writing down. See, um, if we want to follow the Lord along the way and, and be happy, that's how it's going to have to be. You know, people, God's people are miserable today. If you don't believe that, get out and look around and visit a few other churches. And you'll find that God's people are no longer happy. And, and the reason they're not happy, they're expecting things that don't line up in this world. I mean, with this word. They're, they're expecting things. You know, when, when, when he called us pilgrims and strangers, he wasn't just saying something. Uh, when you're pilgrims and strangers, you're never at home. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now, majesty is a term we really don't understand very much in our uh, United States because we don't have a royal leader but majesty, when the queen speaks in England, everyone listens. And when God speaks through that book in your lap, you better listen. Right. You better listen. And you know what? Everybody says, well, the Lord just hadn't showed me that. Well, you know what? I'll say this. You better listen to it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, j j just take it for what it is and embrace it and listen anyway. Uh, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to begin to really focus in 
And if we intend to give the Lord's praise, let's do it and, and recognize the majesty that he, that he has. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Now, I don't know enough about the uh, land of Israel to know uh, if, the, if the cedars here... Are, are the same as the cedars are over there. I really don't know. Cedar wood here is a very soft wood. Uh, if it's not too big, I can take a cedar down with my tractor. Uh, but for just looking what they said again and again and again about the cedars of Lebanon, I wonder if it's a stronger wood than what we understand cedars to be. And, and he's attributing this wind that it's going to break down these cedars, these trees. It's going to bring them down. And then, again, if it's our, it is like our species of cedars, you know what? It takes a lot of wind to bring a cedar down because you know what? They give. They do like this, and they do like this, and then they flop straight back up. So either way, it's a hard thing, but you know what? You're going to experience that. There are going to be events in your life that you feel like, well, it's got me down, it's got me now, I'm through, I'm done. And my question is, when that happens, because it's not an if, it's when that happens, are you going to praise the Lord? Are you going to lift Him up? Are you giving Him great glory for still His majesty and exactly who He is? And the average person cannot. Through the grace of God, you can, but the average person cannot. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedar, yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Not just his voice speaking, his authority. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Now again, he's still talking about cedars. Now I've seen some cedars blowed over, but listen, I've never taken them off, seen a cedar tree dancing. But God can do that. See, uh, in, in man's little finite understanding, we would say, well, that's stupid. No, it's not. Our God can make the cedars to dance according to this. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and, and Syrian like a, young, like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. You know, what a marvelous thing that is. Uh, and we see different divisions all through the Word of God when, when Moses uh, stepped out and and the Red Sea uh, divided, and they ran across dry shod. And uh, but it says here, he, he divided the fire. You know, um, it would have been hard pressed for me, and I just know what my flesh is to walk out in the middle of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And it'd be hard pressed for you to do it too, because you know, have you ever thought about that? Uh, when they looked on the sides, they had to see the fish and. And different things swimming in there right beside them. And they were going on across toward uh, God's promised land. But through the fire. See, uh, make a way through the fire. Uh, looking beside you in hot fire on both sides. He says, I can do that. But to see that beauty and to experience that, you have to go into the fire. Uh, uh, we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The only reason they experienced Christ, because it was Jesus, because even Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and said, Behold, I see a fourth man like unto the Son of God. He saw Christ in that place. To see that, to experience that, that three men had to get into the fire. And so, listen, this morning, it's not for us to be excused from those things. It's to enjoy the personal Christ in those things. Verse 8, the voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of, of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh his, make the hinds to calf and discovereth the forest. And in his temple doeth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the, the Lord sitteth king forever. Now, I really want you to look that it says that he sitteth on the flood. Uh, he's on top of it. See, uh, and we'll see with the word of God. The historic count of the Noah flood had haunted uh, Israel's mind for centuries. Uh, now they had a promise that it won't happen again. 
Now, a lot of people misquote that. Um, he said, I won't destroy the earth again with water. But he didn't say that he would never send a flood. Now, uh, I've told y'all many of this, and uh, uh, it was Brother Van in the back. He pastored First Baptist over at uh, Humble City. Uh, it's a big church, I mean, a big two story house that faced the river, has a concrete wall around it. Faced, uh, I have pictures of water in that house. And that house is not only up on the bank, it's, it's literally lifted up. And you know, see, they thought they could prevent the water getting in their house. You know, in the flood of 1937, there was water in that house because God does what seemeth good unto Himself. And, and, and so we find then, uh, as the as the Lord's people, that we uh, we're not going to be exempt from the flood. The flood is coming. The question is, is what what will you do in the flood? And more so than that, will you give God honor in the flood? And what is the Lord going to do for you during the flood? We're going to be able to give Him praise and great glory. Um, um, First of all, uh, again, I want you to see that the Lord is present in the flood. He's always there. He cannot be, he, he cannot be omnipresent and be exempt from your persecution. I also want you to see that, uh, that uh, he's above the flood. Uh, you know what? When uh, they were, uh, <laughs> uh, when the Lord put them in that situation on, on, on the Red Sea and says, go ye to the other side, he knew full well what was going to happen. Everybody says, well, I wonder if he was praying for them uh, in that prayer. I don't know. The Bible just said that he went over there and prayed. <laughs> but he could have been this. He could have been praying up one of the worst windstorms that ever was. See, because not only did he put them in that, he wanted them in it. He deliberately placed them in it. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, a lot of times we don't understand circumstance and situation. And you know what? It's not given us to understand. He's in the situation. And so we ought to be able to praise him. Another thing that I want you to think about is we begin to think about the flood. He does not have to intervene. Now that's that little Mickey Mouse God that all the world's got out here. If you pray hard enough and you pray long enough, it's all going to work out. The only problem with that, that's not what the Bible teaches. <laughs> right? <coughs> uh, people die. Uh, people get more sick instead of getting better. People, huh. Just because you say jump don't mean God has to hop. And so we see that as we think about the, the flood and the flood waters rising, it doesn't mean that deliverance is going to come. It doesn't mean that you're going to get out of this. And so we as the Lord's people, maybe the first thing that we should pray for is, is to be granted understanding rather than deliverance. And then maybe deliverance will come. Another thing, uh, always remember that uh, that he that he's in control no matter what. Go with me to Joshua. Very familiar verses of scripture, but I want to read them in your hearing. Uh, Joshua twenty four. Joshua twenty four verses two and three. Joshua 24, verses 2 and 3. And Joshua said unto, uh, unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Now, I do want you to, and this is just for your study this week, a little extra information. That Abraham, until God intervened, was an idolater as well. Because it said all three of them served other gods. And you know what? If it wasn't for the goodness of God, you'd be an idolater too this morning. Uh, and and we, would, we would no more follow him than anybody else. Uh, verse 3. Uh, and I took your father Abraham 
from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and I gave him Isaac. Now, uh, I want you to see it says, and I, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. Now, have you ever wondered why possibly, and everybody gets into, you know, debates about redemption and salvation in the Old Testament. I really don't think it's to be debated, uh, debated about that much. Some look toward Christ and we look back to it. And that's about the summation of it as I can see it. But, you know, this is the thing. Um, it said that the reason he did that, now, was Noah saved man? I, I personally believe he was. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord when no one else was. But we find here that Abraham was saved, that, a, that, that Abraham was saved from the flood to do all that he did. Now, was Abraham in the days of the flood? Certainly not. But his grandparents and great grandparents and great 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 grandparents were. See, that's the sovereignty of God. You know why you're here this morning? Because of the goodness of God. You know, uh, the earliest, uh, the y'all know I love genealogy. The early, the line that I like to study on my side, kind of unexplored line, uneducated people. They they were all illiterate, so there's very little documentation. But where they came in at. Is down in the edge of Montgomery County, just on the other side uh, of the county line from Cumberland City. There was a furnace there, and they worked there. And uh, first thing I see about 1840, and uh, they—that's the first instance I know of them. But you know what brought them here? Really, it wasn't the good iron industry and lots of work for poor people, because 200 years later. There was a boy to be born that needed to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and have his heart opened. See, it goes back that far. So when the floods happen, don't look at the flood right now. Look at where it's going. You know, the, the creek at Carlisle runs north this way and empties into the reservoir right down here at Bear Springs. And, 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 and you know, when I was a kid, we always stole stuff in the creek. And look at the way it went, and we never, it really never made sense to us that uh, and when we went by the lake, we never thought about it again. But you know, that's where it was going. So when, when these problems occur, look where it's going. Look at them babies beside you. Listen, if you, if you, uh, oh, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to learn to trust God when you don't trust Him? <clears throat> How are they going to fall on their knees before God and in the in the times of trial if they've never seen that? I'll tell you very simply, they won't. They, they'll, they'll never learn it. Because listen, this world sure ain't going to teach them anything. Right. You, you, you send them youngins down here to this crazy school system. Listen, what you have coming out of the other end of it is little communists. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to follow the Lord with everything that we have. 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 2. Second Samuel chapter, uh, excuse me, 22. It's, uh, 2 Samuel 22 and verse 5. The Bible says... When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, where were the waves coming from? Death, right? Can you can control death? No, you most certainly cannot. If 25 years as a nurse has taught me one thing, when death comes, it's coming. There's not one thing you can do about it. Uh, but he, where did his fear arise? His fear arised from the floods of men, not from death. I don't think David was, was afraid of death. But the floods of men you, you, you better get something done about that. Listen, you're not looking too good. You kind of fail. I don't know about it here. You're not doing too good. Let's go do something. That's the floods of man. Man, you don't know, man. You don't know what's going on with you. You better, you better get some help. That's the floods of man. What about them? 
weakness. You better get that little chip in your hand because you ain't going to be able to buy nothing and your bank card's going to be that way. You better get that little chip and you'll starve to death. That's the floods of men. See, the floods of men will sweep you away. And we live in a day and age which today where nobody is prepared. So when the flood comes, you get to, see, we, we need to be cautious of the floods of men. We need to be cautious of what they teach and what they preach and what they show us because if you're not very careful, you'll get swept away. Now, again, growing up in Carlisle, when I moved over on this side of the river, I betrayed my people and moved to this, this side of the river. And um, I, I, y'all haven't even seen my Y'all you know, haven't even, y'all don't even know what a running creek is. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I wish I could show y'all the little house we grew up. I, I saw it waist deep in the yard where I grew up. And I mean, just walking around in it. And the creek literally be from here almost to the plant from my house in the bath up water. Be, be that big. And you know what? Blood water is scary. It is scary. Now, uh, my friend growing up, Greg Dew, and y'all own heard me speak of Greg Dew. This is this is the Greg that's next to my age, and and we was all playing in the backwater. You know, it takes some really dumb hillbilly kids to play in backwater, but we was all playing in the backwater. And the current caught Greg, and I just missed him. I, I, and I truly was trying to help him, but I mean, I, my arm just wasn't long enough. And so he there there Greg went, and uh, you know what? He was scared. The flood was scaring him. But then it kind of pushed him back aside and he, he got back on his feet and came back and then we got to playing in it. See, we weren't scared of the flood anymore. And uh, uh, we got to be very cautious. We live in a day of floods. We live in a day. Listen, and I know I'm the worst and those of you that are friends with me on Facebook, I know y'all get sick. That's my political uh, propaganda I'm putting out. But, uh, you know what that is when I take time to really, you know, Larry, slow down. You know what it is? It's just another flood. It's just another flood. And uh, it's always been that way. And it, and it always will be that way. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we need to be very, very cautious of the floods of people. Because floods of people are going to push you away. They're going to push you toward the things of this world. Uh, Psalms 18. Psalms 18 in the very first uh, verse. <coughs> Psalms 18 in the very first verse. Another Psalm of David. The Bible says. I will love thee. Now, if you have a good King James Bible, you'll notice that I will is capitalized, so it'd be more, I will, I will love thee. In other words, David had a determination within, uh, within his heart that, that his love, his affections, his, his center of his universe was going to be God. I will love thee, O Lord, <laughs> my strength. Now, David understood that his strength came from God. Now, just to give you, again, some a little food for thought this morning, uh, where, where, did, uh, where did Samson believe his strength came from? His hair. Where did it really come from? It came from God. See, uh, the, and the reason I know that, he brought the temple down. He bought that idolatrous temple down without his hair. So David, with all his effectiveness, he uh, he knew it came from God. When he when he was being uh, he, when he was being successful, he certainly knew that God uh, that God was doing it for him. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. And my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, 
in whom I will trust. So he, get, he gives the Lord three attributions there, uh, three designations, three different roles. He's my rock. That's something that, that is to be rested on. You know what? I never understand these people that don't trust the sufficiency of Christ in, in, in security of the believer or whatever you want to call it because what they're really saying is this, is Lord, you're not able. Uh, you, you, you can't get the job done. You need my help. You, you need me to say some kind of little foolish prayer. You, you need me to hang on faithful. You know what? All we're doing is belittling the person of God. That's all we're doing. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we find that David had great understanding in, in the dispensation before grace. He understood grace more than we did. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Now, you get this. We don't get anything else this morning. You get this. He says he is my fortress. In other words, my the fort that's built around me. He, he is my protection. He, he is the one. So when the arrows come, something's there. When, when, when the bullets begin to fly, he's present. He is my fortress. And if a bullet gets in edgewise, we can only attribute that God made it that way. And take you shot. And see, we as the Lord's people, uh, oh, that's not popular preaching today uh, with all this foolish health and wealth stuff that's been taught, but uh, that is the God of the Bible. He said he's my deliverer. And because he is a deliverer, certainly doesn't mean that he can't. He has to, but he can. My strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation. Now, uh, that, that buckler... Uh, has a has a meaning with that related to their war gear. He says that's what keeps me together. And then he says the horn of my salvation and, and the horn they use to give the commands and say you go this way and you go that way. And and and, and David had enough understanding that it was all done because of the Lord. Every little thing. That happens, God honors it. Uh, the good and the bad. Now, all my family just about here, except my daughter in law and the other two grandchildren, and uh, I don't want no big deal about this. Uh, but I had a, another seizure the other day. You know what? I just laid my hand to God. I wanted it to be different, you know. But that's not. You know, uh, the Bible says David sought the Lord thrice. And then he said, well, my grace is sufficient. Thy grace is sufficient for me. And, and so you just go on and move on. But listen, this is not a health and wealth journey we're on. Uh, we're not having a pillow party. This is serving the mighty God of heaven. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we just... Uh, uh, we just need to recognize that and give him praise and honor for exactly who he is. Verse 3. I will call upon the world, but I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, I think that's interesting. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Now, most of the time, uh, when we say, I will call upon the Lord, we're thinking, Lord, deliver me from this situation. Help me make the light bill. Lord, provide this for me. Provide that for me. But you notice, I don't think that's what David was saying at all, because he'd already recognized God as the complete provider. And he says, uh -huh, I will call upon the Lord... Who is worthy to be praised? It, it had nothing to do with the give me, give me, give me. He just gonna praise him. What about you? How many of your prayers is exclusively an exhortation to God? Just, you know, praise you for being on the throne. Praise you for giving me breath of life. Praise you for these legs that got me up and got me going. Because you know what? They don't have to. I've seen a lot of people that didn't. And so we as the Lord's people... We need to get in a function of praise. And that's what David was saying. Verse 4. The sorrows of death come past me. And the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Now, 
Another flood I want to warn you about is ungodly men. And you listen closely. Most of them will come in the guise of friends. Absolutely. And there'll be floods. And just like me and Greg Dew playing in the flood water at Carlisle, the problem is this. Some of you bitches are going to get the spot you can't swim out of. And you're going to go down. See, uh, people that will lead you from church are not your friends. People that want you to do something else on the Lord's Day is not your friend. People that want you to dress just like this world are not your friend. Now, they're going to present that way. They're going to, they're going to say, uh, they're going to say, oh man, this way is a lot, lot more fun. It, it, you'll enjoy it yourself. And listen, the reason I know I've been there, I've done that, and you know what? They present a very convincing story. But they're not your friends. And see, this is the thing. What's the worst thing you can do for a drowning victim? Come in here and do this. You know what? Take your boat down. That's the worst thing you can do because not only are they going to drown, you're going to drown with them. So they leave you high and dry, so to speak. When the flood gets rough, they are going to leave you by yourself with no help whatsoever. And so we as the Lord's people, certainly we ought to begin to, to understand and know that uh, we have, you know, when, when the Lord said in his, uh, uh, in the church letter, when Paul wrote to the, to the second time to the Corinthian church, he said, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. He wasn't just whistling a tune to that church. Now that church had made some progress, but they needed more. Isn't it a shame today that instead of holiness being an attribute of God's people, people think it's a sect of the Pentecost? Right. See, uh, they took what belongs to us. That, that, that's the real thing. And, and, and so we as, the, uh, we as the Lord's people, we need to, uh, we, not, we need to understand when the flood is coming. Jeremiah, chapter number 46, Jeremiah 46, and we're going to read just verse 8 for time's sake. Jeremiah 46 and verse 8, the Bible says, Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Now, I want you to notice a couple things about this, here, and we're going to close. That uh, nothing happens outside God's plan. Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 9, for this reason I have raised up favor. And you know what? That was in a long, long lineage of Egyptian kings. And he says, this one is the one that I'm going to raise him straight up and take him to the very bottom. And he did, right to the bottom of the Red Sea. And, 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 and so, you know what? There are going to be Egypts that come up. You know what? Next year, here we go. It seems like it's only been a few months to me, but we're fixing to look at another presidential election next year. You know what? I don't know who will be president. But I do know this. The very one that God wants will be sworn into office in January 21, uh, 2021. Because, see, God is sovereign. All his plan. And, and you think about some of the Egyptian pharaohs, what they did uh, to spare... Uh, to, to, I mean, just to kill, to kill children for no reason. Uh, he told the midwives to kill them. And why, why is that so? Because God wanted it that way. 
See, when, when the flood looks like there's no hope. Remember, God is in control. Right. When it looks like, hey, I'm going to have to cave in. God's still on the throne. When there looks like there's no other way, our God is still like that. Uh, do you rest in that? You, you know why people are so just settled in 2019? Is they don't understand the God of the Bible. They really don't. You know what? If I believed in a God that was just wringing his hands, hoping that I might consider him, and, and hoping that I might just pray a little bit to him, you know what? I, I go, I, I'd have some sleepless nights too. Wouldn't you? But <laughs> when I think about the true God of heaven that has put all things under his feet, and has his dear son, Jesus Christ, sitting at his right hand. What have I to fear? But what do I have to be upset about? I guess the real question is this. Do you know it? You know what it says concerning the, sal the salvation of Lydia. Whose heart the Lord opened. See, that's the problem in 2019. We've had far too many... Too many, too many, too many years of the Romans road. And what you have, you have churches full of lost people. And uh, never met the God of the Bible. What, what we need, you know what we need in this country, what we need in Stewart County, is some hearts open. And that's not, that's not, the, that's not the work of man. We, we just preach it, we put it out there, and God in his mercy and his grace, he opens the heart. That's the only question I have for you. I'm not asking what you, if you've been dumped. I'm not asking if you said a sinner's prayer or whatever that means. Has, has your heart ever been opened? Because if it's not, you're still on your way to hell. And uh, that's a sad position.